Hey everybody, Dan Wood here from draft to digital uh, Last week, Mark Lefebvre could not join us uh, because he was traveling here for our Christmas party. Uh, so we're glad to have him in the office and to get to see him. Uh, we thought we'd do like a quick follow-up. We had a question last week where someone was really wanting to know how they should approach small bookstores and libraries. And so Mark Lefebvre just happened to have written a book about that just recently. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about that. I'm going to check in and make sure they can hear us all right. And while Dan does that, maybe I'll do a, a little juggling act or something like that, just to fill the quiet space. <laughs> well, so, still waiting, but... Oh, for confirmation? Our first impromptu. I like impromptu little uh, yeah. sessions. Just putting information out there is always good, isn't so it? We, we have no idea if this will work here or not, but we thought, oh, I think I just got confirmation. Confirmation that we're actually, uh, people can hear us? Yes. So we, we didn't announce this at all, but we will make this available after the fact, so you can watch it at your leisure. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, first of all, I wanted to go a little bit into Mark's history. Uh, the great thing is, is he's had decades of experience within the, the book industry. Um, you know, from, from my point of view, I kind of came into it with the digital revolution. So most of my experience has been in uh, selling digital books. Right. But... There's a lot of opportunity in print, and especially in these small bookstores and libraries. Uh, so first of all, I want to talk, you started your career as a bookseller. Yeah, I actually started in, uh, Dan Dar started in the digital age, and I started in the dark ages uh, <laughs> of, of um, I mean, prior to the internet. So I started in yeah, 19... The Gutenberg Press. Yeah, just a little press after press Gutenberg. Event. Yeah, just a little after Gutenberg. So 92 is when I got my start in, in book selling, and that was prior to... Uh, most of the internet anyways, uh, being sort of a thing that existed. So I come from a tradition of, of as a writer, trying to um, mail my manuscripts into publishers. So that's the, the dark ages of digital publishing. And then uh, working in uh, stores. So I've worked in virtually every kind of bookstore that exists. So I've worked in mall bookstores. I've worked in big box stores. I've worked in uh, uh, chain stores. I've worked in independent bookstores. I've worked in academic bookstores and online bookstores. The only two kinds of bookstores I haven't had the pr privilege of working for yet are a used bookstore and a, maybe a Christian bookstore. Those are the only two kinds that I have. That sounds like something that you do like, <laughs> later on in life. In my spare time, yeah. I'm a used bookstore. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So as, as a bookseller, how would, how would, what was the process for, how would you acquire books? Would you have local authors come in? And I understand that's also different. Because there was a time right. when most self-publishing was more of like a vanity thing. And right. now, let's just get right into it. With your book, how would you recommend, from your experience as a bookseller, Right. You approach, if you're an indie author, how do you approach a local bookstore? So I think the key thing to remember is that every single bookstore is different. Whether it's an independent bookstore, whether it's part of a chain, you're going to find differences in every bookstore. Now, some of the chains have uh, head office procedures for purchases, but in a lot of cases, there's some leeway that they have. And sometimes the local management uh, may interpret those rules a little bit differently. So... In a nutshell, most authors are probably going to use some sort of print-on-demand service to make their books available. So Ingram Spark being obviously the biggest one, obviously D2D Print, very similar, gets you the same sort of similar uh, distribution with uh, not as much control uh, over formatting and, and uh, discounts, etc. But there's two ways that the bookstore can uh, buy your book. Uh, it's through a massive distributor, such as an Ingram, which is the world's largest bookstore. Even in the early 90s, we would be placing a weekly order from Ingram to fulfill our stock. Now, this goes back to the dark ages where there were no computerized systems for looking up Ingram's inventory. They would mail us um, uh, a stack of those like uh, microfiche, oh, my. microfiche wow. uh, that we would put on the little projector and we would have to go and look them up. <laughs> they were alphabetical by title and by author is how we would be able to look up titles to see if they were available at Ingram. Uh, to place those orders. Um, and then they moved on to uh, online ordering systems. Uh, by the time I, I moved out of uh, that that's, uh, book selling, I think in uh, 2010, I think was the last time I'd been ordering from Ingram. Um, but that 
would be all of the books available for England, which would be from major publishers, you know, so Random House and HarperCollins and Macmillan, et cetera. But anything available through Ingram Spark is automatically going to be listed in the system. Now, the main difference, and I'm sure we've talked about this before, but I think it's it's worth driving home, is that with Amazon, uh, well, what used to be CreateSpace, but which is now KDP Print, right. what they call extended distribution, I like to call pretended distribution, because you get the feeling that your book is actually available, and it is available through the same system, but it's automatically flagged as a short discount, 20% discount title, uh, and, and automatically non-returnable, and it's flagged as an Amazon title. And so if you're asking a local independent bookstore to order your book from the, the main competitor that's basically yeah. putting independent bookstores out of business. No, not, they don't like that? No, people don't like that. It's like, hey, yeah. go buy from my competitor. So so just using a service like Ingram Spark or D2D Print or whatever a third party uh, solution that is not uh, the, the world's biggest bookstore competitor right. is probably a good move because the other thing you're going to want to do is is uh, I know with D 2 D print it's it's a a forty percent discount that's automatically offered, right. and most bookstores are looking from anywhere between forty to fifty five percent discount, um, and so that's and kind that's of going to be off of their wholesale or the retail the the retail price that way yeah. they make some money off of it too. Yeah, because you have to remember, I mean, a bookstore is a business, right? Yeah. And um, they keep a cut, they keep that 40 or 50%, and they use that to pay for their staff, to pay for the rent, to pay for all of the other things, the shipping and receiving and all of that stuff. And the other thing, so they have two ways of buying. They can buy the book, but a bookstore is not necessarily going to buy a book that's non-returnable unless they have a really, really good reason to do so. And could you explain that concept? Like yeah. For, I think a lot of people don't realize that with print because the, you know, in ebooks, you just kind of put it out there and there's no cost to have it out on right. the shelf. Yeah. For a bookstore, they kind of have to worry about what they put out and if it doesn't sell. Yeah, now when I used to manage a bookstore and I used to manage the inventory, I used to think of the, 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 the books in the stores like tenants in an apartment building. Are they paying their rent? Right. And, and there'd yeah. be turns. You would look at inventory turns, and you would want your stock to turn three times a year. So if you're, and I'm not going to do the math in my head, but that, that's how you would kind of figure out um, whether or not the book was earning its keep. So the way that the book industry works and has worked since the Great Depression was the books were sold to the bookstore on a fully returnable basis. So it's almost like a consignment-based business, where if after six to six months to nine months or whatever, if they did not sell, the bookstore could send them back to the publisher for a full credit so they could go on and buy other books. Now, this this was a result right. of the Great Depression where bookstores said, well, we can't afford to buy these books anymore. And publishers said, well, wait a second. What if we offer this guarantee that if it yeah, doesn't sell, we'll take bit, it back? Yeah, yeah. So in, in, in many ways, publishers have been the purveyors of risk when it comes to returns. And so booksellers have been, I mean, I grew up in a, a world of bookselling where that was the way it always right. was. And so through Ingram Spark, and uh, in most of the print on demand, it's probably advisable to make your book non-returnable. I have made the mistake. That, that would be that. the biggest reach. To the, there's going to be more yeah. small bookstores that are going to be willing to take that chance. Potentially. Right. Now, the reason they're going to take a chance is because it's an intelligent business move. Because your book is right. something they absolutely have to have. And as a as a bookstore buyer myself, in the past. By default, I would not order anything that was non-returnable. However, I remember, I mean, Terry Fallis, uh, who's a Canadian uh, literary writer, uh, humorist, his very first book was self-published, and it was done through, I think, iUniverse, which is, you know, owned by yeah, the, yeah. the devil, Author Solutions, and all those people. Oops, did I say a bad thing about them? I just, I, I've had I authors know how bad experiences yeah, with this company, yeah. so I don't recommend you you think about working with them. But, uh, and that's just me, Mark, saying it, not saying that on behalf of Draft to Digital. Draft Digital would never say anything nasty about yeah. anyone, ever. Um, but I, when I, I wanted to have Terry come into my bookstore because he was a graduate of McMaster University when I was at the bookstore there, and I went ahead and ordered 50 copies of his book, fully non-returnable, because I knew as a business decision, I was going to be able to sell those books because it was a phenomenal book because I had already read it. I was already familiar with it. And so a bookseller may make a decision like that, uh, a smart business decision, knowing that they're going to be able to return it. The other thing that I've done as an author is I have offered, um, well, if you buy a box of my books so I can come in and do the event, I will guarantee to buy that book back from you at the end of the event, so you're not stuck with any stock. Like maybe you want to keep a couple. Yeah, that's a good deal. And uh, I usually ask 
would you please be willing to give me your staff discount? Now, most bookstores have a staff discount. It's usually in the 20 to 30% range. Okay. And so at that point in time, the bookstore is selling the book, obviously at a discount, so they're not making their full margin on it. But this additional stock is something that they're not going to lose money on. They're going to make a little bit of money on. So they're, it's almost like you're guaranteeing, the way that publishers guarantee that you can return the stock, you're guaranteeing that if you don't sell out at my event, uh, I'll buy the extra still stock. Make, you as the bookstore owner will still make some money. Exactly. Not have to worry about having lost income. And most booksellers I've offered that to are pretty cool about that. Uh, they they recognize that it's you know I'm I'm making uh, a business decision for them. I'm helping them make it easier for them to see. Well, we're doing this event. We're, we have to do posters. We have to do whatever. We have to right. set things up. We may have to bring an extra staff for this. It costs them money and time. And oftentimes, an event, you know, uh, doesn't work out so well. Yeah. Um, and now, now that works out for me because I sell my own books directly at uh, book fairs and right. things like that, where I've bought my own table. And so, for me, having extra stock is not the end of the world. Now, that may be different for you. If you're, uh, different different authors may and not and like that. that line, um, what are the downsides or the risks to you as an author about making returns available just yeah. in general from like, let's say Ingram or any product right. man provider you're working with? Well, it's interesting. I was at an industry event in May. Uh, the book industry study group had a really yeah. amazing event in May in New York about uh, print on demand and, and, and the new the new methodology. And the representative from Ingram that was there said that um, the returns for print on demand titles at Ingram are less than 1% in total. So that seems like a very minor yeah. risk. Yeah. Here's one of the problems. I mean, that 1% is still a gigantic number because you got to right. remember Ingram is no small company. 1% is, is, is right. <laughs> hundreds of thousands yeah. or maybe, you know, uh, millions of dollars for all I know. Uh, when I made my very first book that I did print on demand, 2004, I made it fully returnable, full discount. And then I was working within the Canadian publishing industry and one of the buyers at Chapters Indigo, which is kind of like Canada's version of Barnes & Noble, they caught wind that the book was available, found that it was available through Ingram and decided to order 350 copies that they distributed to a bunch of chapters right. and Indigo stores across Canada, which was pretty exciting at the exactly. time. Yeah. And then uh, six months later when they returned 150 of them, the cost to me uh, because what I was having them uh, uh, disposed of. They could right. be shipped to you, but you would pay for shipping, or you could dispose of them and you would pay a disposal fee. The cost for the returns on 150 books cost me more than I earned on selling 350. Yeah, so the stuff that's like you yeah. take into that whole equation of, does it make sense for me to do the returns? Many people, and kind of the way you know, we're looking at with our front demand model, is not necessarily offering returns, but uh, just giving a better discount because right. that can also kind of offset yeah. uh, the cost. And so that could be a deal. Now, the other thing you can do is uh, the bookstore either orders it from Ingram, for example, right. or if you have stock because you've purchased it from another bookstore at a discount, right. or you've purchased them yourself through you know the the direct print, or you've used a local printer. In some cases, as a Canadian. I use a local printer in the Kitchener Waterloo area because even though the cost per unit is is higher, uh, I don't have to pay shipping across the border, which can really so really add up. So that definitely makes sense. Yeah, so that's I mean, worth looking into. If you are someone that does a lot of events and you, you really like that aspect of it, because not every any uh, no. author wants to be going to bookstores and no. doing signings, but for people to do, sometimes having your own offset run of print yeah. makes sense. Exactly. Um, yeah. Like the, the book that's right there, that was printed from a local printer. Uh, which So what I can do then, rather than ordering it through Ingram, I can make sure that my cost is enough that I've budgeted between the print cost and the retail price, you know, a 40 or 50% margin so that I can go and do a direct consignment with the bookstore where you come in. And in some cases, I mean, I've done bookstores where you bring in your stock, they take a count of the stock, and then at the end of the event, they say, well, this is how many we rang through the register, and they cut you a check right then and there. Other cases, uh, you know, nine months later, you'll get a check from head office or or, or whatever. And so it's, it, they all do it different ways. Somebody, yeah. So I think the key thing is um, recognizing that within reason, when you, when you approach them with a professional idea and a professional business plan, that is actually potentially, hey, there's, there's no way you can lose money here. Right. Like if I stand there in your store and I don't sell a single book, you're going to be guaranteed to sell all 30 copies of the book and make right. some money. At the very least, I, I've supported it. Uh, but I strongly recommend before you 
you do that, you, you, you are familiar with the local bookstore, that you actually know them. Like, if you already have a relationship with them, it's so much easier to talk yeah. about that. I, you know, we've seen it happen with authors we work with who go to conferences, the authors getting to know the merchandisers at the different retailers. If you know someone and, like, you meet them in person, it's so much more likely they're going to want to work with you. For sure, um, for sure. Well, especially if it's a good if it's a good relationship yeah. you have, as opposed to yeah. a hostile one, right? Yeah. No, I, I joke, I joke, but I mean, having been a bookseller, uh, I have actually um, been in stores as a bookseller where an author would come in, and even if their book was published through a major publisher, and now if your book is published through a publisher, well, that makes it that much easier, right? Because yeah. I can go, well, this uh, Haunted Hospitals, for example, is, is available fully returnable from Dundurn, uh, which is University of Toronto Press Distribution in Canada. It's Ingram in the States. Fully returnable. Bob's your uncle. Nice and easy. Yeah. This book here is available through my imprint, Stark Publishing, available through you know non-returnable print on demand, or I can get consignment for you. Um, but and I lost track of where I was going with that, with the relationship. Oh, uh, authors would come into the store and see their book down on the on the floor, like on the floor level yeah. or not eye level, and they would take their book and they would go and put it face up. It yeah. But they would cover four other spines of books. Yeah. M meaning, like, not only is that a, a dick move because it's not in alphabetical order, right. which is where people are going to find it, but you're also covering up other titles that people may be looking for. And um, nine times out of ten, when authors came in and did that, every time they came in the store, they would do that. Yeah. So every time they came in the store, I would make sure that I had to do maintenance behind them to clean up the mess right. that they would make. I tended not to want to help those authors. When it came time to return, because if these were books that were you know fully returnable, right. and I had a choice between their book and some other book, it, it, all things being equal. I mean, if it was selling, I wouldn't return it. But yeah. if it wasn't selling and this wasn't selling, guess which book I got rid of? Because that got rid of another problem in the store. The yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, this annoying person is not going to annoy me anymore because they won't be able to do that. So I think I think it's key. On, on the flip side, having an author come into the store and talk about and share some interesting insights uh, about their book it was phenomenal because I was able to use that as a bookseller to put that book in the customer's hand. So let's say somebody's looking for. Uh, a certain type of thriller or a cer certain type of romance. And if, if I knew that the, the author had written that romance because they were at their grandmother's cottage and they saw this beautiful old photograph and it inspired this story, when I put the book in the customer's hand and I share that story, because that's what booksellers right. love to do, I've suddenly connected the author and the reader in a way that can't happen as easily yeah. in an online transaction. Hand selling is still the number one yeah. thing out there. So that's awesome. Let's go a little bit into um, your history and your experience as not only have you been a bookseller, you've worked in the industry on the print level, uh, you were with Cobra Writing Life and it helped build that program from the very beginning. So right. you get the digital part, but you're an author. Yeah. And so and not only a self-published author, but you've worked with traditional publishing uh, in Canada for a lot of your books. And so how has that experience, like has it shown you different aspects of the industry? Yeah, I think one of the things I'm very fortunate to understand is that there are so many different pathways to success. There's no one way of doing it, right? If if there are ways to work with traditional publishers that get me things I could never have with self-publishing, and and that's distribution, for example. Like Dundurn, I may give up a huge percentage of royalties on Dundurn, but I make very little royalties on eBooks from Dundurn. I make most of my money off print book sales. And um, they can get my book into Costco, and they can get my book into Walmart, and they right. have. And it is something I could never dream of doing, as much knowledge I, as, as I have. pretty fair to say that it, the traditional route is going to be, like, if you want to get your book into a bookstore, like, onto a physical shelf, right. traditional is going to be a much easier route? Easier, not yeah. necessarily successful, but right. easier, because right. you can contact the bookstore and say, oh, my book's available through, et cetera. Uh, and the and the bookstore can order it in no risk to them, right? right? If if it's a, a book that they think they're they're going to sell. Now, if I go to a science fiction specialty bookstore and ask them to order in my romance novel, that's probably not a good fit. So you also have to think about so figuring out the clientele. What works best for them. And like in, yeah. in your case, um, you've got several books that are localized, and so they're very particular, like the haunted stories from a particular city. Yeah. So exactly. I imagine it's a lot easier and within that town 
to get those bookstores because it's so applicable to their yeah yeah for sure and that's where Costco would do the buying right because they actually do local buying even though it's a, it's a it's a chain and so I mean that's how I sold the books to the publisher knowing that the publisher could easily sell those books to a bookstore yeah. and and that's one of the ways that I pitch a book but I mean it's no different if I were to pitch the book uh, you know uh, that I had published myself I would still use the same factor saying here's your demographic, here's your audience, and here's how this book fulfills this need. Right. I mean, you always have to be thinking about that. So when you're talking to a local bookstore, you're not just thinking about, hey, I'm a cool dude and I just wrote a book and you should like me. It's, yeah. no, 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 here's how this book is going to fulfill a need that your consumers already have. So we're right. actually working together to do exactly what the bookstore wants to do, which is to have books uh, available that, um, that are going to be uh, in demand right. and so similarly if you know that you're going to be getting media exposure whether it's traditionally published or self-published if you know there's going to be a local review in the local paper or local radio or whatever give that local bookstore a heads up yeah. even if it's fully non-returnable you can say hey just to let you know uh you know i love your bookstore i've been i've been there I sh I'm, I'm, I'm from the neighborhood I wanted to let you know I'm going to be on this radio station or I'm going to have this article come out in the paper. Here's the information about my book. Just because as a bookseller myself, I would constantly get people come into the bookstore and say, oh, I mean, Oprah sure was the big one. Saw that and yeah. then they're out of stock. And they or they don't know about it. it. Who wants to wait? Yeah, but even if they know about it and then somebody comes in, they go, oh, yeah, yeah we can get that for you. Even if they don't have it in stock, yeah. at the very least, you've helped the bookseller by giving them information so they know where you, where they can get the book, or they or they might even say, yeah, but it's also available on ebook, and, and you can get it anywhere. Yeah. But if you want a special order, come see me. Uh, I mean, it's a partnership you have with your local bookstore. It's, it's it's this mutual supportive relationship that I think is so critical for 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 the community itself to have that bookstore right. there, but then for the author to be part of that community because because it, it really does it really does work well when when the, when they serve yeah. one another. These people working at bookstores, they really do get a thrill out of helping people find just the right thing that they're wanting to read. Yeah. And then they also, the business angle of it, they just need to pay their rent, they need right. to pay their employees. <laughs> and yeah. so it's, it's passion plus business, any, right? I, we were just talking about this earlier today. Anything, when we work with our retailers, the more work we can do for them to make it easy for them, uh, the more likely we are to get chosen for promotions. And so, yeah. Sam Bank. Let's go ahead and move on to libraries. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I want to start with, uh, if you'd explain like the print angle of libraries, <clears throat> but then I do want to talk a little bit towards the end about digital, like getting your book okay. digitally into libraries. Well, the digital is easy because yeah. draft to digital can help you with that. Wink, I wink. I heard that. <laughs> nudge, nudge. So with print, uh, I mean, through draft to digital print or through a place like Ingram Spark, I mean, Ingram being the world's largest wholesaler, that's one way to make your book available to libraries. Make sure the library knows your book is available. There's uh, IS like provide the ISBN uh, to make it easier for and them to find it. About the print ISBN. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah. the print ISBN. I mean, I let them know all the versions. It's like right. here's the audiobook, here's the print, here's the ebook, so that if they're all available, then then they can make that decision. Do you send the wait until you have all three <clears throat> formats ready, or do you kind of approach them? I I very rarely have had all three of them uh, available together. Okay. Sometimes I usually start usually I start with the print because libraries are still. I mean, we know how digital works, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but when it comes to to print, that there's still a lot of consumers. So one of the things we always fall into the trap of is we're digital people, right? So yes. we understand this world, and 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 it's a huge market for a lot of people making good money. But the reality is that most people have never read a book. And, and if you find people who've read a book, most people who've read a book have never read a digital book. Yeah. So still, you know, upwards of 70 or 80% of readers have never read a digital book. Right. So there are stats that are showing that audiobooks are going to surpass ebooks in terms of that. People are willing to give audiobooks a chance because of the multitasking involved. So you have to remember that as big as it can be for digital, it can be even bigger for print because more readers out there than ever before have never even heard of you if you're only in digital yeah. and you're only an ebook available. So the local library, when I start with the local library, what I love to do is provide the, you know, here's the ISBN for the print book, here's where you can get it, it's available through Ingram. And I also like to let them know I start local. There's um, uh, Robert J. Sawyer, Canadian science fiction author, a good friend of mine, gave me this advice years ago and I've used it consistently, very successfully, is define yourself as a big fish in a small pool. 
And Rob yeah. would always say this. And so I start with my local neighborhood library and I let them know, hey, I'm in your neighborhood. And then I move to the next ones. Hey, I'm in your city. Hey, and I'm in your county. The dynamic yeah. goes on with being active at that library or just for sure. At that library. So they recognize you already. You're a regular. You're there. I was there every yeah. weekend with my son, you know, when he was growing up. But that was a Saturday event. They would recognize my face going, oh, wow, he's a patron, but he's also an author. And, 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 and they want to support their own. I mean, my most successful book to date from traditional publishing comes from the smallest city, uh, Sudbury, Ontario. Spooky Sudbury outsells Macabre, Montreal is the world, the, the Canada's second largest city. And Spooky Sudbury still outsells that. It's just like 190,000 people as opposed to millions of people. Right. And even Hamilton, which is half a million people, doesn't doesn't sell as much as Spooky Sudbury. And that's a backlist title. Yeah. That's like from 2014 or something, I think, or 13 when that came out. And it still outsells the newer ones uh, because the, there's that community-based thing. Right. And people really want to support their own. And so yeah, that's, I, yeah. We constantly have our, uh, our partners that sell the libraries um, asking, you know, like, let us know which ones are local to this area. This to state. the state, exactly. If it's a librarian, so that makes a much bigger difference than it might in retail. Yeah. Um, well, you curation. Know, you really don't get that question on Amazon or maybe on, on Kobo, but um, with the print books, and they just they seem to like the, the local feel of it. Um, yeah. So it, it's something I was glad to see, um, and so we, we continue to work with them. I was also kind of surprised. I didn't realize when we first started working with library partners how much of what they acquire for their collection is based off of just requests from from patrons yeah yeah and so but this is true for both print and digital um you know let your readers know they can request your book at the library if you made it available um yeah you know, you yourself request your library again you know, buy a copy because they do want those local things. Sometimes they'll have special sections to highlight local authors. Or, or themes, right? Of, of stories set in the city. Yeah. Just because they may get people coming in wanting to read, like, I want to read a thriller, but I want to read a thriller set in the city. Yeah. Uh, you, you think about, uh, I, I always like to say that the acquisitions librarian is great. I mean, the smaller librarian, there's usually one or two people doing all the jobs. Yeah. But in the larger librarians, you have the acquisitions librarian, you have the reference librarian, you have the events librarian. Now the reference librarian is is like a data nerd who just loves to have information. Just to figure out what's yeah. circulating really well. <clears throat> you know, looking at the, the list of holds and knowing yeah. hey, maybe we should get another copy of this book because we have people waiting for months. Or people who come in and are trying to do research. This 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 librarian has been my best friend in research yeah, for so many books. Sense. So I know that if I can let the research librarian know about my obscure book that may not have a wide demographic, but uh, if they know about it and a patron comes in, they'll store that information and go, yeah, actually we have a local author who's done a book on just that right. topic. And, and that can be a, a benefit because, I mean, at the end of the day, what you've done is you've cultivated a relationship with somebody who wants to put the right book in the right person's hands. Right. And, and that's a critical thing because you as the author have connected with that reader that you were looking for in the beginning. And it, you're not just doing it on your own, but you're doing it with a collaborative partner. Yeah. who's just as happy to do that because they solved the problem for that cu customer too. We've talked a lot internally about just how shocked we are with Macmillan changing their terms mm. and how anti-library some of these terms have, have gotten. Right. I, I feel like it's such a short-term <laughs> strategy. It's not looking at well, librarians play such an important part in the whole curation and introducing people to things that they will love for years, if not decades to come. I know. I grew up going to the library. I couldn't afford to buy all those books. I would read books. Now as an adult, I have bought most of those books that I loved as a child that were, you know, yes, I was reading them for free uh, in, in a way for a little while, but, um, you know, I became a, a, a lifelong reader, a lifelong follower of certain authors. And so thanks to the uh, library. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I, I think everyone should try to cultivate that relationship with their local librarian right. and enjoy because these are services that are, they help our communities, they help uh, you know, us individually. You mentioned like the, the research aspect of it and that's really how helpful for nonfiction or even 
there's lots of fiction where you do need to do the research and everything. So. Yeah, it never hurts. I mean, the other thing, when you talk about something like Macmillan, I think this is a perfect opportunity for independent authors and small publishers to identify, okay, what are the titles being published by Macmillan this fall or in January or whatever the season is, knowing that the library can only get one copy of the book available, but they probably have 800 people that they want to service. Yeah. And, and I went through a lot of examples in the book where I, I live looked at the title, at the holds for some new titles and what it meant. So if I have any books that could fulfill the needs of those consumers, I know they can buy my books through print or you know, thanks to draft to digital through Overdrive or Hoopla or, right. or one of the other partners that we have, that they can get it for a lot cheaper and fulfill the needs of hundreds of their consumers or their patrons and satisfy them so they're not waiting six months to, to get that and, book and I've seen uh, like my our local library uses overdrive but they've done a lot of curation where it's like read alikes if you like this you'll like that yeah and I can see libraries doing that in ways where there's a big title coming out but someone's refusing to sell them copies of it yeah if you have something that's like that yeah, let the libraries know. And, it just makes perfect sense. And and if you're local, it's the additional flavor. Right. Well, it's like a Jack Reacher book, but it's written by a local author, you know, Dan Wood, right? Whoa, wait, wait, the guy's from here? Yeah, yeah. he's from here. That's that alone is 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 I mean, I was at I was at a bar the other night. Imagine that. I was at a bar the what? other night. And uh, when Liz and I were sitting there, the, the guys beside us, they'd never met a Canadians before, so they were really excited, but they'd never met an author before. And these guys were beside themselves that, oh, my God, you're an author? I just take it for granted. I'm like, hey, I'm an author. Oh, God, another author. But you have to remember that. Like, oh, my God, you're an author? Yeah. Like, that, that's still a thing. We, we lose sight of that because we, we interact with authors all yeah. the time. But that's a big thing. So not only is this book in a genre that is going to be satisfying, but the author is local. Oh, my right. goodness. I remember the first time having a local author and being able to go and buy their books and, and just – thinking this was the best thing in the world. Right. I want to talk a little bit about specifically formats to libraries. So with print, we mentioned the small bookstores, they might be not want to order from certain people <laughs> that are trying to drive them out of business. Yeah, potentially. Uh, Imagine that. So th that's true for print libraries as well. Like, yeah. uh, libraries, by and large, don't order very often from Amazon. Right. Um, so they're going to want to order through one of their preferred vendors like Ingram, mm -hmm. Um, Baker Taylor, although I think Baker Taylor might be changing out of that model, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, there's just some stuff going on with Baker and Taylor and Ingram and the merger there that we don't know how it's going to go. But I mean, Baker and Taylor is a wholesaler right. of ebooks and uh, and the libraries books. all have approved vendors they can work with, and yes. so um, they're going to want to order from those vendors. So just finding out from your library, like if your book is available there. Um, you know, I, I think they're, they're going to be more than willing to help you with that. Um, audio. So you yeah. have your, both some of your traditional, but also yeah. your... Um, Actually, no traditional audiobooks. All of my audiobooks are independently. Oh, uh, well, okay. Yeah. So, and <laughs> I've, how, I've done a lot more steps. How, how are you distributing them? Are you hitting the libraries? And what's, how, how's that yeah, going? most of my audiobooks are distributed through Findaway. Mm -hmm. uh, Findaway Voices, Findaway. And uh, I've done a combination. Uh, now, interestingly enough, I only have one full-length novel. All the rest of my audiobooks are shorter. So they would be uh, anywhere between uh, 10,000 words to 20,000 words. Okay. And so the cost to produce them was significant, significantly cheaper. Right. It's only an hour to two hours of, of whatever playtime. But I'm not making my money off of places like Audible or Kobo or Google Play or Apple Books. I'm making most of my money off of a uh, cost per checkout model through libraries, where instead of making the whatever percent you make, 45% or whatever that you make from selling the one-off copy, I'm getting that with every checkout, I get a micropayment. It's one-tenth of the price. But in a lot of cases, those books have paid for themselves within the first six to nine months of producing the audio book. So can you explain that model versus the traditional model? Okay, so the traditional model is the library curates and buys a book to put it in stock so their patrons can check it out. So they'll buy one copy, but they so can only kinda, loan... Kinda, I mean, it's true print, but they're also yeah. buying it with 
digital. Yeah. So with audio, they buy one copy, they can check one copy out to you. At a time, yeah. While you have the copy out, I have to wait for it. Exactly. Same thing with the digital book. Yeah, so that's the one. That's the, the, the one-to-one license right. is what it's known as. And, and that's, uh, that's a typical thing. Now, I know Draft Digital has the one-to-one -one license and the cost per checkout with OverDrive, as well as several of our partners. The cost per checkout means instead of the library curating and only putting the, let's say, these 10 titles we can afford to buy, you can, you can check them out. They say, well, we're going to take all these 100 titles and we're going to show them to our customers and, and let them check them out. And when they check them out, you're only going to get one-tenth of it. But if 100 people show up and want to check out that book, right. they all can at the same time. So, so a book club, for example. In that case, like if you had a radio interview or a TV interview and yeah. 1,000 people saw it, it's like, I want to read that and set their local library. They, all 1,000 could uh, at the same time. Yeah, like the, a lot of cities are doing the one city, one book, where, right. where they, the library encourages them to read one book. It's imagine getting something like that because you're a local author and they want to support right. you. And then the cost per checkout model could mean, whoa, this could really add up really, really quickly. Those micro, you, you don't, don't dispute those micropayments. So what I've been doing is I've been reinvesting those back into making more audiobooks because now, because a lot of it is short fiction, now I can now recurate full-length books of audio that are already paid for right. and, and make them available in, in, in whole new ways. So, and, and in your case, um, you know, many people, when you're talking audio, have just heard of Audible. Right. But the Audible model, people are generally, they can buy books, but they're generally using a credit. Like they're getting a certain number of credits yeah. for their subscription costs. So buying a four-hour book with one credit versus a 25-hour book with one credit, yeah, it kind of makes it a hard uh, sell for some, especially with nonfiction tends to be shorter like that. Exactly. Um, you with find a way you have control over your price. Yeah, you have your control of your price with all all vendors except the, the Audible except and, the Audible, and yeah. Yeah, which which sets the price for you, and that's dependent on who knows how they're deciding uh, the right. price, but uh, yeah. Uh, even my full-length audiobook is not fifteen dollars, which is the monthly credit for Audible. Right. So it's not worth wasting a credit of fifteen dollars on something worth less than fifteen. So I mean, it's smart consumer behavior. Yeah. But similarly, I mean, there are uh, you know people do buy uh, things off of Audible at a reduced price. They have the deals and things like that. Now with Findaway and Chirp and the discounting and, and all of the things that like Chirp is the book bub for audiobooks there are going to be opportunities for authors who have control over their price to be able to, to get into these promos. And, and, uh, and, and I'm really excited. We're just, and, and if you, ha if you don't have more and more of that, like uh, yeah. Apple has been doing a ton of promotions around audio books exactly. uh, at lower cost. And a lot of them have been indies because the indies having that much more control and a willingness to experiment, I think. Oh, for sure. Um, so that's been exciting to see. I know I picked up a couple of audiobooks between like three ninety nine, four ninety nine, five ninety nine from that, from Chirp. Like I get the daily Chirp email. Yeah. Uh, so there's been some great deals, especially on like classics from like, you know a lot of it's backlist from the traditional publishers and yeah. then indie works. And so it's an exciting time to be dealing with audiobooks and yeah, you know, libraries are a huge part of that process. And so. Um, you know, I encourage everyone, you, if you have to choose between being exclusive with Audible, uh, you get paid a little bit more, but I think you're missing out on so much because libraries are buying so many audiobooks right now. Yeah, and, and I think people always look at it, because Audible does have a very attractive, I don't have to pay anything option, yeah. but you're stuck for seven years. Right. And I, I would rather not be locked into something like that. And I would rather invest. And, and again, I've taken a different approach. It's like, I don't have the money. I did one full length book and it was very expensive to do. It was $350 US per hour. And that, and that cost me a lot of money. I haven't made my money back on that yet, but I own the rights to it. Yeah. So and it's kind of a lifelong investment in yeah. yourself and more than likely over time, you're going to make the money back. It's I, I imagine I will because yeah. the very first book I self-published in 2004, I still make money off of. Yeah. Not a ton of money, but I do nothing to promote yeah. and it still makes me money. So all of these IPs, all of these assets you have available as an author can earn you money over time. And that, and that's the key. It's not, I'm not just looking at my, my dash, draft to digital dashboard every day right. to see if I'm making money, yeah. but I'm looking at the long term of, of all of the different books that I've published in all the different formats available through all the platforms. 
So let's, let's begin to wrap up. Are there any tips or tricks from your book that you, you we haven't covered yet that you might want to like just throw out yeah. there for an author really trying to think beyond, <clears throat> you know, a lot of them have the digital aspect down. Right. You know, they're, they're killing it with Facebook ads or Amazon ads. Mm -hmm. They're selling books on digital platforms. Any advice you say for bookstores, for libraries? Yeah, I mean, for libraries, one of the things I like to do is I like to go to overdrive.com and knowing that my books are available on Overdrive, you have an author page on Overdrive, kind of. Excellent. The search results, I don't right? think I realize that. Yeah, I mean, it's not as pretty as our author right. pages, but you've got that uh, ability. I mean, you can create an author landing page at draft to digital with your print or your ebook and audio book right now, which is a nice catch all because right. I know if you click onto a retailer like Amazon that also has the print book, it's just, it's going to be on that item page anyways. Um, so that's fulfilling and being, yeah, being able to search. So what I like to do is I like to provide um, not just the information about it, but if I know the library is using overdrive, I'll include here's the books listing on overdrive, you know, to make it that much easier for them right. to not have to go look up that information. You know, I mean, a lot yeah, of times. It's definitely, it, the easier you make it for them. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah, that's an easy. Yeah, you know, it's it's why you have like the one click at you know retailers, just make it easy, make it quick, and yeah. Like and it. I say, and I say that because I see a lot of authors who who send to a, an independent bookstore or send to the library and go, oh, and here's my book on Amazon. You can buy it there. No, yeah. I, it sounds like we we roll our eyes and go, oh my god, how yeah. did you do that? But <laughs> but because it's like, well, it's Amazon. That's the only place that exists. Why wouldn't you just buy it there? Uh, and people don't realize that that is a huge slap in the face. So it may, I mean, you may you may get an open-minded bookseller or librarian that goes, oh, okay, and great. Out, and outside the U.S., Amazon is not as big or as powerful. Like in exactly. U.S., U.K., Amazon is huge. Like there's no doubt yeah. in that. But not everywhere. It's not even available in some countries, yeah. too. So. That's uh, that's one of the other things. So I think little things like that. I mean, I even had I did a section on on um, successful book events when you're doing an in-person book event because we do we spend so much time training people on how to improve your Amazon listing and how to have a beautiful cover and the yeah. description and stuff, but they forget the face-to-face -face interactions. Little subtle things like I was with some hugely successful independent authors at a Barnes and Noble in, in yeah. Vegas when we were there for a conference, and I I was so excited to see them at the event and. What I recognize is that with human nature, the books were right there and people would walk into the Barnes Noble and see them, but they would be intimidated and they don't want to be sold to. Right. So I took a small stack of the books and I put them about 10 feet away. And that's what I always do for my own signing so that the people can see the authors there. And if they're interested, but they, I mean, we're all introverts as a lot, yeah. a lot of writers are. So are readers. They want to go, they're in a bookstore because they want to stick their yeah. face in a book. They won't have to talk to an author. Yeah. So they'll go over, especially me and my skeleton and all the crazy stuff that I have when I do a, a book signing is they might not want to talk to the crazy author, but they can go check out the book from a safe distance where I'm not going to try to sell to them. And if they're interested and they go, Ooh, this looks good. Nine times yeah, out of 10, they cool. rush yeah. over and go, Oh my God, are you the author? Can I get it signed? Yeah. So you immediately, little things like that, I think, can, can go a long, long way to making uh, you know, a successful in person event. Yeah, just trying to think about the reader experience overall. Yeah. Well, when you share, share the name of it, because I'm afraid I'm going to butcher the name of the book. <laughs> oh. It is an author's guide to working with libraries and bookstores. And, and if you go to books2read.com slash working with libraries and bookstores. And we'll share that in the chat. Yeah. Um, so You'll find it at all retailers. We, we didn't really take any uh, <laughs> questions this time. Like uh, we're just trying out a little bit of different formats. We have yeah, I can't even, I can off. see there are questions or comments, yeah. but I can't read them with um, my glasses. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the comments and answer anything we can after the fact. But I yeah. just want to take advantage of the wealth of knowledge that Mark has um, on that because we know people are really looking on those way the ways to get into libraries and small bookstores. So thank you for being here with us, and we will talk to you later. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dan.